Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our August 25th Metro Board meeting. Um, I will call a meeting to order and ask for a roll call. Director Brown? Here. Director Downing? Here. Director Dutra? Director Colin Terry Johnson? Present. Director Koenig? Here. Director Lynn? Here. Director McPherson? Here. Uh, Director Newsom is absent today. Director Pagler? Here. Director Kiros Carter is absent today. Director Rockman? Here. Ex officio Director Harrison is absent today. Ex officio Director North. <laughs> Thank you, and we have quorum. Wonderful, thank you. Just a couple of announcements that today's meeting is being broadcast by community television, and Language Line Services is providing Spanish interpretation. Um, that'll go to the board to see if there are any. Sure, they can announce that it's Spanish. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm just zooming along. Um, could you please provide that announcement in Spanish? Uh, my name is Hector, and if anyone needs Spanish interpretation, I'm going to. Agenda for today, please let the board chair know so that we can assist you. Uh, mi nombre es Hector. Uh, si alguien necesita servicios de interpretación en esta agenda, por favor déjenme saber al, 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 a la silla para que la podamos asistir. Gracias. Thank you for being here, Hector. Okay. Any comments from board members? Any announcements? All right, um, so I'll note that there is oral written communication that was sent to the board. There were five items in our packet. Received another uh, written communication via email yesterday afternoon, and Mr. John Ergo will respond to that and send the response to the board. All right. Um, Labor organization. I am. Thank you, Director Rodkin. It's it's a bit of a morning. It's foggy and it's heavy and not like that heavy, but it's foggy heavy. So thank you for helping me clear the fog. Any um, oral communications here in person? Thank you. Thank you, Brian. People to the trail now. Um, nice to be present here. Like like the facilities and. Uh, so oh, it's good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not here necessarily on a friendly note. I'm here to make actually a complaint about the Metro Board and the representation representatives for the Regional Transportation Commission. Guy Preston announced his retirement at the last meeting, and we consider that actually him quitting. And uh, I'll talk to you about the rationale, but give you some background of why we believe it's valid what we're saying that he quit. And he's quitting because of the policies of the board members on the RTC. I personally have been involved in transportation for over 25 years. Got involved with regional Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission 25 years ago. And as most of all, you know that I'm actively involved. We have a network of friends. I get a lot of information from them. Um, actually, they're very good friends with Guy who goes to dinner with them. So we have very insightful information. Uh, in our communication, you'll see a, a specific call out um, by Andy Schiffer about his personal discussions with Guy. That's not public information. And that gives you an information that we have insight that Guy's not pleased. He, he loved that job. He loved the job. He, and he's very frustrated. He's very eco-friendly. He lives in Seabright. He wants the trail built, and he's very frustrated that it's not being built. And the ultimate trail is stopping the trail from being built. We need to vote for the interim trail. Guy has expressed that personal to his friends, to RCT members, that he wants the trail built, and he's frustrated. And he doesn't want a record that's going to materialize and that trail doesn't get built. Only 1.2 miles have been built over the decade. And that 
section that they're building right now costs more than widening the highway per mile. Building a 12-foot mile trail, 12-foot wide trail that costs more than widening the highway, you know there's something wrong. And you're actually destroying, clear-cutting more trees. Guy is very upset. He's expressed to his friends about the clear cutting of trees for the ultimate trail. We need the intro trail. That's the solution. And if we vote for it, you never know. Guy might come back. You might find that he might come back. I'm just saying, I'm not giving any guarantees, but I wish that you would all start opening the coastal trail and stop holding it hostage. We need that open. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else wish to speak who's here in person? Do you have anyone online, Donna? There are no hands raised. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. Yes. I just want to say that I think Mr. Bryant, people's comments this morning are completely inappropriate. He has every right to express his views about what we ought to be doing, what the RTC ought to be doing in other groups. We don't typically respond to everything that people say in oral communication. It is completely inappropriate for him to put words in the mouth of somebody else. Um, Guy Preston has every opportunity, has had and has every opportunity to express what his views are about this issue. The commission actually carries, mostly carries out the recommendations that he makes to us. And uh, in this case, the recommendations have been that in the, on the ultimate trail that we consider the two options and do what we thought was best. Um, he has, it's a little too convenient that the views, the, the secret views held by Guy Preston correspond perfectly with what Brian People says at every meeting that he comes to. So I just want to, I want to put that on the record. I don't think it's appropriate for him to put words in Guy Preston's mouth. Let Guy Preston speak for himself. Let uh, Brian People speak for himself. It's quite welcome that do that week. Uh, accepted them in the past and will in the future zone views about these matters. But I feel quite strongly it's just really, really inappropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rothkin. Um, other announcements, comments by directors? Okay. So let's go to labor organization communication. Online. No hands are raised. Okay. All right, then we'll move on to any additional documentation to support the agenda of the roadmap. Okay. Now we are on consent. Those are items 8.1 through 8.12. Um, are there uh, questions or comments, or are there any items that, that directors wish to pull? I'd like to pull item 8.6. Okay. Any others? Okay, so let me, let's then take 8.1 through 8.12 with the exception of 8.6. Let me see if there's, I, I need to, yeah. Now I remembered. <laughs> um, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on items 8.1 through 8.12 with the exception of 8.6? Okay, anyone online? Okay. Okay, on 8.6, this is the Sorry, let's, let's move 8.1 through 8.12. Oh, Second. This motion to approve the remaining items. Second. 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 Okay. Second. 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 Director Second. Second. Director Second. 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 Director Second. 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 Director Lynn. Uh, Director McPherson. Aye. Director Paper. Aye. Director Rock. Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. Now we'll go to 8.6. I'm sorry, I want to raise a question. Since we're no longer, we have nobody who on the board is attending uh, remotely, are we not able to go back to simply voice votes on these uh, matters rather than roll calls? You can. Would, and wouldn't that be more sensible generally? <laughs> You can do that. You only have to do low call when there's somebody. Else. Okay. Right. Right. We'll do that on eight point six then. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so 8.6 is about the air transit service. I have two, two things. First of all, I want to know how good our service is in terms of uh, arriving in the, the um, ready window the time that people expect the uh, air transit van to show up. Our, our goal is to have 90, be 90% 90 within that. And, uh, when, and when you're outside of it, sometimes it's by you know, 30 seconds or a minute, not necessarily that you're half an hour later or something. And we do really, really well. We Somewhere between 90 Three of the worst the last three years uh, at one point, but mostly 98, 99% within that window. And that's fantastic. I noted when I was reading through the agenda item that the rides uh, by month are up this year from last year. If you look and you compare, this is on page 8.6.1. It must have been that in front of us. You don't need to see it. It, it's, it shows that we have an increase of riders this in April this year over April last year, and May this year over May last year, uh, and, uh, in June this year over, over last year, which is great. But it also shows that this year the number of riders in air transit is going down from April to May to June. And I was wanted to ask why that is the case, or what's going on there, if anybody can give us some insight into that, because it's a concern. We're out of COVID. I mean, COVID's still around, but it's, we're generally seeing less impact of it. And, sort of getting back to normal, but that, those numbers seem to be going down rather than up, which is I found surprising. Thank you. Um, does that mean what? Uh, good morning, Margot Ross, COO for Santa Cruz Metro. Daniel uh, can probably answer that question uh, better than me. He's on the line. Uh, oh, there we go. Good morning, um, everyone. So um, I didn't get the whole question because my computer's going off and on, but if you could repeat that, I would be happy to answer that for you. I'll, I'll come to the main question. It looks like our, the number of people riding paratransit is going down between April and May and between May and June this year. And I was wondering why that is the case. Actually, um, it, it is um, going up. Um, historically, um, we we do a bulk of rides to the Stroke Center at Cabrillo. So when Cabrillo is um, <clears throat> is on vacation, our rides go down um, quite a bit during that time. So that might be the reason that you see. Um, Lower ride amounts for May and June. Okay, well, that, it appears on 8.6.1. Maybe if you could send us some information about that after the meeting, that would be helpful. Absolutely. Otherwise, we've approved the site. I'll second. Can I ask a question, please? Did you look at the June from last year to this year? Yeah, yeah, it's going up every. Yeah. But, but, Ju but June, you said, was coming down? No, no. What's happened is if you compare uh, April. 22 to April 23, it goes up by about almost a thousand rides. It was almost a thousand rides up in, from in May 22 to May 23, and up about a hundred rides, not, not as many, but still goes up from June 22 to June 20, 23. Mm -hmm. But then I looked at the next, I was confused at first about how they could even be going down, but then I realized it's comparing <laughs> different things. But, but for this year, if you look at what are the rides, uh, Comparing April to May to June, they go down each month. And did last year do the same thing? But yes, it's like, okay. and so there's something going on. And maybe the career thing. It's the, it's our time. I would think that some of the things change. Yeah. It's like student ridership. I mean, yeah. 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 This year it went from about 7,000 in April, 6,800 in May, 6,200 in June. So you can see that pattern last year. It went about 5,700 in April, 5,600 in May, 5,750 in June. Yeah, also, if I can add, we do do school rides as well. Um, so that may contribute to the decrease uh, also, along with the, the Cabrillo College. It sounds like Daniel will give us some details so Daniel will see that that's the case or not. Um, actually, explore his numbers and get you guys some details. Great. Thank you, Margo. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks for the question. 
Director McPherson. Oh, a different one. Uh, I, no. I want to just ask this on the 8489 UCF uh, SC ridership. It says, you know, the bullet point says Q4 ridership decreased 14.9%, but it looks like increased. Did I, am I reading something wrong on that chart? I think you're reading it correctly. I saw the same. It, it appears it should say increased by 14.9. You might just check. And I think elsewhere in one of the items, it shows it as an increase in other text. So. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, let me see if there are any comments um, on 8.6. Um, folks who are here in person and online, no? Okay, now I'll bring it back to the board. I'll move the board I think so, yes. Okay, so all in favor, um, aye. say aye. 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 Um, any abstentions? Any no's? Okay, that passes. Thank you. Um, all right, we are on our regular agenda. Item nine is presentation of employee longevity for Mr. Wesley Guild, um, who has been here with the Metro for 10 years. And I believe, is, is Mr. Guild here? Not here. So let's just take a moment to thank you for your service to the Metro and all your work. Um, any other comments from directors? Okay. And we have um, a few retirees here on item 10. Um, Peg Fletcher, Harlan Glatt, Andrew Kearney, Paul Lennon, and Maricela Mendoza. Um, we have their resolutions and our board packet. Is any, are any of you here or online? Director Rapkin. Okay. Any um, other comments or questions by board members? Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 I think I heard a unanimous, but any abstentions or any no's? Okay. Um, thank you for your years of service. We're on item 11, oral report on hydrogen technology in the marketplace for public transit and the Alliance for Renewable Clean Hydrogen Energy Systems. Um, please, Mr. Undemuth. Good morning. Uh, uh, good morning, board members, uh, staff, and guests. Uh, we're here today to provide oral report on uh, hydrogen technology in the marketplace and also on the Alliance of Renewable Clean energy, uh, hydrogen energy system, which is basically called ARCHES. Uh, as you know, this board approved METRO's uh, zero rollout plan back in January, and we submitted our road plan uh, to CARB, California Air Resource Board, in March, and it was approved. So uh, uh, now uh, this is uh, our rollout plan suggested that we uh, are suggested that based on uh, route analysis and the available energy. Uh, majority of our fleet to be uh, hydrogen or fuel cell uh, masses. And still, we do have uh, battery electric mass in our fleet. Uh, this is given our uh, high vulnerability to natural disaster and uh, uh, strongest top of that we have in this county. And also, those masses, those hydrogen fuel cell masses, would be able to achieve uh, roughly over 300 miles. And with hydrogen fuel cell bus, Metro can replace the internal combustion system on the basis of one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, over the last uh, five, six months, we received uh, roughly 20.4 uh, million from uh, FTA in order grant, and another 38 million, 38.6 uh, million from FSIP, and 4.8 million from Federal Highway, and three more million from uh, uh, FTA. So uh, we are really in a good position to purchase roughly uh, I think some of the passes in the coming months. We'll bring those uh, uh, proposals to this board in the coming months. Uh, this is this is going to be, we hope this is going to be the largest acquisition of fuel cell buses in the nation. Uh, we invited here two experts, Jamie Levin, uh, Director of West Coast Operation uh, from City. And we also uh, invited uh, Scott Brandt, uh, CEO of Arts and Associate Vice Provost for Research and Innovation at the University of California, uh, Office of the President, to provide oral report on those te this technology. 
And Arches, we really are support Arches. Arches is a public and private partnership to create a sustainable uh, statewide clean hydrogen uh, hub in California and beyond. They're based on a local renewable resource to, pro uh, to produce hydrogen. Uh, Mr. Levin has more than 29 years experience working in transit sector in the transit industry and more than 24 years in uh, working on hydrogen fuel technology. Uh, please welcome uh, uh, Mr. Levin. Thank you very much. I had to negotiate 880 coming down here during the war. So I, and I, 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 every day I take my bicycle to work. So it's been a sacrifice, but worth it. So I thank you very much for letting me come and, and to present. And as Wanda Moon said, I really come from a transit background. I, I was 11 years at San Francisco Muni, 15 years at AC Transit, where I was the director of environmental technology and started their fuel cell program. So Michael really wanted me to present to you uh, some background on where the technology is and how that fits with your efforts and why you are leaders, but you're leaders at the right time. Uh, so I will go through these slides and uh, uh, first what I'd like to give you a bit of background of our organization, CTE. Uh, I left AC Transit 10 years ago to join this nonprofit. Uh, we are an organization of about 65 people. Uh, we, we have over 30 years a portfolio of zero emission projects of over $1 billion. Uh, presently, we have about 159 <coughs> projects valued at over $365 million. And we have a national presence. Uh, my office is in Berkeley. Our main office is in uh, Atlanta. We have members of our organization, many large companies that are involved in hydrogen and battery electric. We don't just do uh, fuel cells. We are also actively involved with uh, the deployment of battery electric vehicles. You can see in this slide here, uh, just an overview. We're, we're, we're very active in California because there's a lot of money in California. You probably are aware over $24 billion have been raised through the cap and trade program. And so given our governor's focus and the state legislature, there are many projects happening here, but also uh, across the country. I mean, as the saying goes, what happens in California goes elsewhere. We're now the fourth largest GDP. We exceed Germany in terms of gross uh, domestic pro uh, uh, product. Uh, our organization is quite involved in a lot of projects. I don't expect you to read all or go through all these different projects, but not only buses, but we're very involved in truck uh, deployments. We actually have a, a, a very exciting project out of the port of Oakland with Hyundai uh, with class eight fuel cell trucks and those zero emission fuel, trucks, fuel cell trucks will eventually be bringing fuel to your destination. We need zero emission well to wheel, not just part of the, 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 the trip, but all of the trip. Uh, but I highlighted three key projects and activities with AC Transit, Sam Transit, and Foothill. And the reason I highlighted those is that those are organizations like yours, uh, transit agencies, uh, that have really now made a commitment, as you are potentially making next month, to fuel cell technology. AC Transit, which I previously mentioned, I helped start that program, but it's grown phenomenally well. Uh, in their initial Trans transition plan to zero emission, which is required by the CARB Innovative Clean Transit Regulation. They assume 30% of their 650 bus fleet would be, would be uh, fuel cell and 70% would be battery. Uh, their recent uh, plan that was published this last year has reversed that. 70% fuel cell, 30%. They are also a member of Arches, which uh, Scott Brandt will give you some more background as the exciting opportunities that, that you will realize with the Arches program. Sam Trans, another example, they have a fleet of over 300 buses. We're actively working with them. Uh, they started with battery electric. There will probably be, as with all of you, a mix of battery and fuel cell. It's not one versus the other. It's a combination depending on 
the duty cycle and what your requirements are. But in the case of Samtrans, they were focused entirely on battery electric, and they are now making a shift to fuel cell. They have purchased 10 buses. Uh, we're setting up an interim fueling uh, station at their north division, north of the San Francisco airport. And we're working on a plan to convert the entire north base division of 150 to 200 buses to fuel cell. Uh, in the case of Foothill Transit, they were one of the leaders in uh, battery electric deployment. They're still moving in that direction. But we just finished, and I'll have a photo to show you a bit later, uh, installing a on a 40 by 60 foot footprint which you have real estate issues here, and those are challenges, but on a 40 by 60 foot footprint, we're, we will be able to fill 100 buses in their fleet. And they, they have recently placed the largest order of 33 fuel cell buses. Uh, those buses have been delivered. They're in service as we speak over the last several months, and they're ordering another 19 uh, uh, from another uh, supplier. So I, I wanted to emphasize these because you are not only leaders, but you're, le you're, 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 you're in the wave of everyone else that's moving in this direction. And uh, I would compliment you in terms of your vision and the like. Uh, I, this is just to give you an idea of the, the big class eight truck project that's zero emission that CTE is managing. Uh, these are the first 10 trucks leaving Korea uh, now in operation uh, from the Port of Oakland out into the Central Valley. Uh, and so we're very excited about the, the prospects for long-haul trucking, regional trucking, and the like that will benefit all of our communities. Uh, in case you're not fully aware of how fuel cell works, it is not a battery. It does not store energy. Uh, it utilizes onboard stored hydrogen and through the fuel cell as a chemical reaction creates electric power up to uh, several hundred kilowatts. In the case of the buses, it's a hundred kilowatt system and the buses use batteries as well to recapture regenerative uh, braking energy. But the only emission out of the exhaust is, uh, is, is uh, vapor. Uh, of course, where does the hydrogen come from? And we'll touch on that. Arches will give you uh, the, the approach that the state is actively taking to get you green hydrogen, which means 100% renewable with a carbon intensity of zero at a price that's affordable. Uh, so uh, in the case of the uh, operation of the fuel cell, it does not combust uh, the fuel. It, it's a chemical reaction. It's very quiet and, and the like. Uh, what are the advantages of fuel cell buses? Uh, there, here are four identified advantages. One is this extended range, as Wanda Mu spoke to. Uh, two is a reduction in the weight of the vehicle so that you can maximize the weight, the, the number of passengers on the vehicle. The third key factor is the speed by which you can refuel the vehicles. So you're not changing from your current operating environment. There's no question, batteries are more efficient than fuel cells. Batteries are somewhere around 85 to 90% efficient. A fuel cell is around 60, we're seeing now upwards of 65%, but it's operational efficiency. So you're not burdened necessarily by the time and, and the location of where you recharge your vehicles. We can uh, refuel them with fuel cell uh, with hydrogen and hydrogen stations in about six to 10 minutes, similar to CNG and, and to diesel. And as Wanda Moose said, uh, the ability to one-to-one -one replace your existing fleet. Now, but what isn't here and what is really critical, and you, especially here in Santa Cruz, but all of us in California, is resiliency. What happens when the grid goes out? We all know that buses are an important resource to move people who are in need of transport. So people at hospitals or senior centers, if there were a serious earthquake here in Santa Cruz and you had to move people to San Jose or elsewhere on available roads, uh, fuel cells can be continually operated up. You can refuel them with hydrogen. So that is the other key advantage. But 
There are infrastructure challenges. And I'll quickly go through the five key aspects of this. This is not the most uh, innovative acronym, but if it works. Uh, it's parsing out these, these five key challenges. The first is price. And it is very expensive hydrogen right now. Although for transit in bulk quantity, it's about nine to $13 per kilogram. A kilogram of hydrogen is about equivalent to a, a, a gallon of diesel fuel. But the fuel cell buses get at least two times better fuel economy. So you get an advantage with the efficiency. However, it's still too expensive. And uh, Scott will speak to what Arches is going to do, what the state of California is going to do to drive that price down for green hydrogen. Secondly, the area of footprint. You don't have a lot of real estate here. So the ability to locate the infrastructure on your available land is a challenge, whether it's battery or fuel cell. But as I said previously, on a 40 by 60 foot footprint at Foothill Transit, which also has limited real estate, we're going to be able to fill 100 buses and we have a plan to add another 100 to be able to fuel 200 buses at that site. A third, our three aspects are renewability, uh, the renewable aspect of, of your fuel. I mentioned resiliency and redundancy. You have to pull your buses out every day at AMP to move people from A to B. So you have to have your fuel, you have to have that access. So redundancy is important that your equipment can continually operate. S, I mentioned already the speed of fueling. So it doesn't change what your current operating uh, conditions are. And E is entry level startup. It does cost more to start up a hydrogen program, but as we will show on this slide here, which is conceptual, but it is proving in practice. In the, for a small fleet, the effort and the cost to uh, initiate a, a electric, battery electric program and a charging uh, system is a lot easier than with fuel cells. But as your fleet expands, that's where the curves cross. And where that exactly happens, some argue it's much earlier than what we show here, but inevitably they will cross. And with larger fleet applications, hydrogen has those benefits that I mentioned earlier, operationally uh, of value. I wanted to show this, I won't go through all the detail, but just to understand, um, uh, there are three categories of, uh, of variables in the specification of the vehicle, the fuel cell power rating, the battery energy storage on the bus, and the hydrogen energy storage. And there's various aspects of that. But the modes that this technology is being applied to, in rail, there's a, a fuel cell train that's being set up in uh, San Bernardino. Uh, there's a plan for Valley Link from Livermore, Pleasanton, over to the Central Valley to do a fuel cell train. Uh, coaches are being looked at. Uh, Caltrans is interested in a fuel cell coach because it can give it, the, the fuel cell can give that coach three axle vehicle, the range and the speed. And we know you've had challenges with battery electric testing over the uh, 17 to San Jose. Fuel cells are a key aspect. That's why Caltrans has funded Humboldt Transit Authority with over $8 million to develop a prototype that you would eventually be able to take advantage of. That's not ready yet, but it's, it's, it's certainly developing. And then buses, there are essentially right now only two OEMs in the United States that meet by America, new flyer for 40 and 60 foot buses. That's in the mix of what you, if you approve next month, that's what would be in the mix for your application, being able to serve uh, UC Santa Cruz from downtown uh, Santa Cruz. El Dorado makes a 40 foot fuel cell bus. Gilly is not yet there, but as their uh, vice president for marketing, Bill Fay, has made it clear, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. They're a little bit uh, taking a bit more cautious approach, but they are definitely moving in that direction. Uh, I wanted to just show you this. There are many fuel cell suppliers and there are different options with both coaches and buses. So the market is, is there potentially, it's not just technology readiness, but it's manufacturing readiness. 
Uh, and then on the fuel side, there are at least 11 potential station providers if you move forward to build a hydrogen fueling station. Uh, there's a limit of actual fuel suppliers. Air Liquide, Air Products, Libby are the three main ones. Plug Power is also, they're building a facility uh, near Fresno that will use wastewater and electrolysis to make green hydrogen, which likely could be a source for, for Santa Cruz. Arches is, is really the key, and Scott will speak to that. There we go. Oops, I. So uh, this just gives you a, a view of the different stations that we have been engaged with, with Orange County, Sunline Transit actually uses electrolysis for their fueling. We have a project with uh, in Illinois uh, that also is using electrolysis. Uh, the Foothill Transit just opened. That's a very large station to support 100 buses. And of course, AC Transit has several stations and they're planning to, to double that number and expand from where they are now. Uh, and you can see here worldwide, uh, fuel cell technology is growing and we're looking at uh, over uh, 1,300 fuel cell buses to date that are playing out mostly in Asia. And then lastly, uh, I think I missed there. So this is the Arches program, which is a thousand bus initiative with 13 agencies and in both Southern and Northern California. And you are one of those 13 agencies if you continue to move on that track. Uh, I also listed a few others that are not in the Arches mix, but they will all benefit from what is happening here in California. In fact, the whole industry across the United States is going to benefit from what we uh, are doing here. And with that, I will conclude and give Scott uh, time to really talk about Arches and what the important meaning of that is for your future as well. So thank you for your time. I may have gone a few minutes over, but uh, I, I will certainly be available if you have questions afterward. And Scott? I'll let you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, thank you. So I have a few slides as well. Uh, all right, well, thank you so much for uh, giving me a chance to talk to you as well in the few minutes remaining. Uh, I'm Scott Brandt. Uh, in addition to being uh, Associate Vice President for Research and Innovation at UC Office of the President and the uh, Interim Arches COO. I say interim because uh, we're still building up our uh, infrastructure. I don't actually get paid for that uh, yet. But um, I'm also a professor at UC Santa Cruz where I've been for 24 years. I mean, in fact, my daughter just graduated from Kirby High School right around the corner from here. So I'm a long time Santa Cruz resident. And I'm really, really pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today about Arches. So if we could bring up my slides. We have those queued up. My cursor. All right. Well, uh, well, while we're bringing those up, I'll just tell you. So I've been working on arches now for uh, almost two years, um, and uh, really, really excited to tell you about it. So this is a, a project uh, that we've been doing, really for the good of the state. So arches is a uh, operates as a nonprofit. Technically, it's a <laughs> LLC, but all of the partners in it are nonprofits. Um, and so it operates as a nonprofit. We're, uh, we're doing it because we think it's the right thing for the state of California um, and its residents. Um, so uh, our mission is really to bring hydrogen energy to the state of California, um, uh, clean green hydrogen energy exclusively, uh, and to help develop a, a clean hydrogen market uh, and economy in California. Um, the partners are the University of California, the state of California through the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, the State Building and Construction Trades Council of California, which is a coalition of 157 unions statewide, and then the Renewables 100 Policy Institute, which is an NGO devoted to renewable energy. Um, uh, so those are the four key partners in uh, our, the Arches uh, organization itself. And then we have a network of uh, uh, municipal and industry partners who are uh, involved in actually developing the project. There'll be uh, subcontractors under Arches to implement the projects themselves, um, but not actually partners in the organization itself. So Arches itself will administer the funds that come through us, uh, but we won't implement the, the projects. Our partners will implement the projects. 
So we'll administer and oversee the program. We'll implement certain portions of the program that are distributed in statewide. For, his, for instance, uh, uh, managing community benefits, managing workforce development, things like that, that really are cross-cutting across all projects. But then our partners will be uh, uh, managing their own projects themselves. For example, if you're, if you're uh, uh, doing fuel cell buses, you will do that. We won't do that for you. Uh, but we'll administer the funds uh, and help you with uh, certain aspects of the projects and connecting you with other partners uh, for the pieces that uh, we can help you with there. So um, uh, if we could bring these slides up, that would be helpful. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, OK. So the, um, where we're at in the process right now is uh, we have applied to the Department of Energy for a $1.25 billion grant. Uh, in addition, we have uh, roughly $2 billion in matching funds committed from the state of California, and then an additional 10 point something billion in matching funds from various municipalities and uh, industry partners, uh, rounding out about a $13 billion funding package in total. Uh, we have 39 project partners uh, in total, uh, constituting uh, hydrogen production, hydrogen use, uh, and hydrogen transportation and storage. Very little storage, it's mostly transportation. Our goal is to do uh, production and offtake uh, well matched over the course of the project so we don't have to store very much. Most of the storage is sort of buffering storage in transit. Um, a little bit of storage on site and some of the larger off takers, uh, uh, again, just sort of buffering capacity. Um, uh, and uh, we're going from about, oh, there we go, about uh, 30 metric tons per day at the beginning to 515 metric tons per day at the end of the project. Um, uh, and that's the, that's the sort of high level goal. Okay, if we could go to the, oh, I got the, I got the controls here. Yes. Okay. So, this is, our, this is our high level goal. We want to create a market and ecosystem, as I said. Our goal is really to support the state in uh, uh, using fully renewable resources to fully decarbonize the regional economy, starting, of course, with the state of California. But our goal is to create something that can extend beyond California into the larger region. Ultimately, part of the DOE's goal is to interconnect these hubs that they're sponsoring uh, to reach the whole nation. Um, and we're prioritizing environmental justice, equity, economic leadership, workforce development, and we're ultimately uh, hydrogen market viability because if it's not, if we don't create a viable market, this won't take off and become self sustaining. Um, uh, I mentioned it's really a partnership between industry, higher ed, and our DOE national labs, but the state of California, labor, and the communities that we're uh, working with and in. Um, uh, and really, it is fundamentally a, a, a partnership, and an unprecedented partnership. The state is actually a partner in the Arches organization itself, as is labor. And that's uh, really unprecedented. When we went to present to the DOE uh, earlier this month, they were really stunned that we had labor as a full partner in the organization itself. We brought the, the national head of the uh, building and construction trades organization with us in the room to present to them. And apparently, that's never happened before. They were, they were shocked. Um, uh, we uh, really just, they're a partner in every aspect of this from the very beginning. Um, and in fact, the, the head of the AFL-CIO offered to come too. We thought that was a little bit much, so we didn't. We didn't in fact, they also asked when they should walk the proposal into the White House. <laughs> we said, you know, okay, that's a cool thing, but uh, that seems a little extreme. Uh, uh, but in any case, uh, 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 that really, this is a true partnership at, at, at all levels uh, to achieve our goals. Um, the principles that we've had from day one are as follows. Uh, we felt that this really had to be statewide. Initially, there were a number of different proposal efforts. When you put a billion dollars on the table, there are a lot of people that want to play. And there were many different proposal efforts. But we really felt for this to work uh, and serve the state, it had to be a statewide proposal. Uh, that brought everybody together. And so we worked really, really hard to bring everyone to the table and have one proposal that serves the entire state. Uh, and Jamie can attest to this. Uh, it was uh, an interesting process to get everybody working together on one proposal. And uh, uh, I traveled the entire state, uh, meeting with people all over the place to get everyone together. We also uh, 
make sure that it's a clean, green hydrogen only, that uh, we're committed to using renewable resources, period, nothing else. Um, and then it has to be stakeholder and community engaged. And we held dozens of meetings with community groups around the state uh, um, to ensure that we talked to people, we talked to community groups, we talked to individuals, and made sure that we heard from people, we listened, uh, and that we are engaged. And we have over 50 community groups that have signed on to be uh, supporters of Archers, to talk with us. We have uh, community representatives that are reaching out into communities to make sure that we're hearing from people and talking to them and making sure that their voices are part of the process. And we have seats on the board for community representatives. Uh, we have a seat for tribal nations. We have a seat for community representatives. Um, uh, we have a seat for cities and local governments to make sure that their voices stay heard. Um, and that their participation is guaranteed throughout. We also wanted to make sure that uh, everything we do is equity and justice centered. Um, that's a key principle for us, it's for California. It's also required by the Department of Energy, but uh, this is California, and uh, anything that we're doing in California has to make sure that those things remain central to what we do. And that we're, what we're doing is aligned with state interests. The DOE has its, its uh, goals, California has our goals as well. And so we have to overlay those on anything that we're doing. Um, and that's part of why we got uh, the state of California in as a partner as well. Um, because uh, Both because we need them uh, to help support this and we need the state's funds to match. And because we want to make sure that as we're going forward, we're really doing this in a way that will support uh, California's longer term goals. And we need to be solution oriented. The Department of Energy has aggressive uh, financial goals, uh, and one of them is to get ultimately get uh, hydrogen down to two dollars per kilogram uh, at, uh, in the production uh, stage, so that if the production costs are two dollars per kilogram of produced hydrogen. Uh, but uh, right now we can't do that, and so that's going to require that we're not just focused on infrastructure development, but they're all also focused on solutions. We have to have technical solutions. We have to have market solutions. We have to have community solutions that make this viable for the people in those communities. We have to be thinking about ways to make this work. Um, and we have to have objective and unbiased uh, governance. Um, we have to make sure that all parties are represented at the table. Um, uh, and that was a key principle from the very start. Uh, and in addition, we have to make sure that we're uh, approaching this from all dimensions. This is not just a technical problem. It's a social problem. It's a market problem. There are, there are uh, uh, every aspect of this has to be considered as we're going forward. And we've kept that uh, as a key principle in everything that we're doing. Finally, it has to be connected. Um, uh, this is not, uh, again, it's not just a technical problem. It's a social problem, it's an economic problem, it's a supply chain problem. Uh, we have to be connected with governments, we have to be connected with the utilities, we have to be connected with the, the communities, uh, and then we have to be connected with the other hubs as we go forward. Um, and finally, uh, there, is a, there is an aspect of this within the DOE that's all about risk. <laughs> we have to actually deliver. And when we're working with our business partners, when we're working with the, the, the uh, state and local governments, when we're working with uh, the municipalities, we have to make sure that we actually deliver what we're saying we're going to deliver. And so uh, those, are our, those are our principles. Uh, so what are our goals? Establish an exemplary uh, renewable clean hydrogen hub in California by 2030. Kickstart commercial viability of hydrogen, uh, focusing on the hardest to decarbonize sectors. Uh, these are the sectors that were identified in the 2045 scoping plan for California. Um, and this is a critical point. In that scoping plan, they identified uh, uh, a plan to get to a, a zero carbon economy in California by 2045. And what they found was we can get somewhere between 80 and 90% of the way there with electrification and battery electric. But what they found was there's about 10 to 20% of the economy that we can't solve with battery electric. <coughs> And key areas were ports, power, and heavy duty transportation that we just can't solve with bad electric. And hydrogen was identified in that plan as a, as a key solution for those. Um, and so that's what we're focused on. Um, and there also, additionally, uh, heavy industry, aviation, maritime, and agriculture, other areas where uh, hydrogen can be a key solution uh, and provide really good. Uh, 
really good results. Those are harder. So ports, power, and transportation are where we can immediately have an impact. Uh, heavy industry, aviation, maritime, and agriculture are a little bit further down the road. So we're focused in the short term on these three uh, immediate sectors. Um, additionally, we want to ramp production up from 30 metric tons per day, which we could do now, to 500 plus metric tons per day by 2030. We want to produce measurable benefits for California communities with robust, robust monitoring and strong accountability and develop a hydrogen workforce for California and a roadmap for uh, uh, developing a workforce for the nation. And then, of course, help California uh, and the nation meet the carbon neutrality goals. So what's special about ARCH is this was part of our argument for the DOE. Uh, we're ready to go. We've got infrastructure in place, and we've got plans to build more. Uh, so we've got infrastructure readiness. We have early and diverse offtake. We're ready. Uh, the, the other places aren't so ready, but you know, California is already using hydrogen in many places, and we're ready to build up that offtake right now. We have a really diverse, uh, integrated team of players ready to uh, ramp up in terms of production, in terms of consumption, in terms of uh, uh, transportation of hydrogen. Um, we selected 39 projects as part of Arches, uh, which is much more than any other state. I mean, California is big and diverse. We know that already. But in terms of its hydrogen economy, uh, it's, it's incredible. They said that our proposal was by far the most uh, diverse uh, and, and complete. Um, and we've been working on it for almost two years already. Uh, where others are proposing what they're going to do, they said we're already doing it, uh, which was fantastic. Um, so what do we have? We have a network of 39 projects ready to go uh, almost tomorrow. Uh, and then we have another 31 projects that we didn't propose for funding from the DOE, but which we could have actually included that are also ready to go. They will probably be getting funding from other sources, possibly state funding, um, as part of the larger network, uh, Arches network. Uh, and then 400 plus OEMs, technology providers, and suppliers that are kind of part of the larger uh, Arches network of uh, uh, organizations and companies. Um, and so we actually have, we have a set of working groups that are working with us to, to write white papers, sort of uh, helping define uh, the Arches um, roadmap for California. Uh, uh, actively working with us. We have 400 uh, or so, maybe more than 400 at this point, organizations actively participating with us in writing those white papers. And the, the, the governor recently put out a, a, a memo laying out part of his plan and explicitly called out those white papers as part of his strategy. So what does Arches look like? Well, we have a renewable feedstock uh, consisting of um, solar power, uh, uh, wind generation, um, hydroelectric, <coughs> and then biogenic uh, sources such as municipal waste, woody biomass, and wastewater. Uh, those are feeding into electrolytic production. <clears throat> so any source of you know, renewable electricity can go into electrical, electrolytic production. <clears throat> so water, uh, plus uh, uh, any source of electricity from renewable sources. I don't know if you guys remember this, but I remember in grade school, we would take a nine volt battery and two wires and stick it in water and then you get bubbles coming up. Mm -hmm. Basically what you're doing is using electricity to crack the H2O uh, of the water into H2 and O. And the H2 is hydrogen. And so that's what you can do. That's what using renewable sources of electricity to crack the water into hydrogen and oxygen. And then you can capture that hydrogen and, and basically bottle it up. And now you've taken your renewable source of electricity and uh, converted water into hydrogen. Uh, and you can also use any source of uh, um, stuff like woody biomass. So if they're, if they're doing things like uh, uh, in the forests, clearing up all of the, the you know, uh, dangerous biomass in the forest that is at risk of uh, causing wildfires and clearing out some of that mass, they can use that mass then 
uh, uh, to do biohydrogen production. And at the same time, they could do carbon capture. Uh, as they're using that biomass to produce hydrogen, they can do carbon capture. So in fact, it's not zero, our, our production is not going to be zero carbon. It's actually negative. It's carbon negative overall because of this carbon capture that they're doing uh, uh, with the biomass uh, hydrogen production. So then uh, we've got a distribution infrastructure that is some pipelines and some trucking with a little bit of storage on site for some of the, uh, the big users. Um, uh, but most of our storage is sort of in transit in the pipelines and in the trucks. Uh, and for now, uh, it takes time to build the pipeline. So for now, there's uh, uh, some trucking and pipelines. Over time, we're going to build more, more and more pipelines and use less trucking. And then uh, our end use, which is, as I said, power, heavy-duty transportation and transit, and ports. And the ports, it's drainage, so short-haul trucking, and then the port operations themselves, the various sorts of uh, uh, vehicles there. So, um, oh, I see we're covering up a lot of the words there. But uh, one of the key things about this is that we really want to help the communities that are impacted by uh, uh, pollution and low income, et cetera. And so we deliberately cited these in communities that are heavily impacted at present. And that's one of the requirements of the, the Federal Justice 40 initiative. And this, is, this program is, is part of that initiative, which requires that uh, uh, certain programs are required to help disadvantaged communities. And in that Justice 40 initiative, 40% 40 of the rather poorly defined benefits of those programs must flow to disadvantaged communities. So we're allowed to define the benefits, uh, but uh, there's a database that shows uh, disadvantaged communities, and it's very broadly defined. It includes low income, low rates of health insurance, high incidence of various illnesses, such as cancer or lung disease, et cetera. Um, so we, we looked at that. We also have Cal Enviro Screen in California that has similar kinds of data. And we looked at our ARCHIS sites, and that includes uh, port areas and uh, transportation corridors in the middle of the state and low-income areas, uh, et cetera. And we actually have cited and chose, that's one of the ways that we chose our, uh, which projects to include. And we're focused around the LA Long Beach area, the North Bay area, the San Francisco Bay area, and then the transportation corridor up and down the middle. Our, our offtake and end use is clustered around the North Bay area and the Elton Long Beach area. And then a lot of our production is, and transportation is up and down the transportation corridors in the middle. And that maps uh, uh, correlates very closely with uh, the disadvantaged communities in this case. Um, and in particular, there's a lot of uh, uh, pollution in those areas. And also in low-income areas in this state, it's also areas with high incidences of uh, lung cancer uh, and various cancers, uh, lung disease, etc. And then we did some analysis of um, uh, what the economic benefits would be. Uh, and first, well, first of all, we looked at what the uh, air quality benefits would be. And we're uh, transitioning to hydrogen has tremendous value in terms of uh, reduction in air pollution. And then there are some tools that the, the federal government developed to look at what the economic value of those reductions in air pollution are. And so we did some calculation. And it includes things like reduction in uh, uh, hospital visits, reduction in uh, uh, bronchitis, reduction in lung cancer, reduction in asthma, uh, reduction in then insurance costs, lost work days, premature deaths, all of those things. And what we calculated was that based on the uh, air quality improvements from all of the funded, DOE funded arches projects, uh, the actual economic value of the reduction in air pollution from just the DOE funded portion is about $3 billion a year. That's extraordinary. We're talking about $13 billion worth of projects producing $3 billion a year in economic value just from the reduction in uh, air pollution. That's not counting the, the, uh, what it's going to inject into the economy directly in terms of uh, jobs, for example. It's going to be, our estimate is 200 to 400,000 jobs per year produced from the projects themselves, um, you know, plus $3 billion a year in improved health 
uh, benefits. So uh, we think the project just pays for itself. Forget about all the other benefits. Uh, if, uh, certain people, I think, in our government, they only care about the money. So this is that's their argument for that. I personally, I grew up with asthma. Uh, I used to end up in the hospital as a kid uh, at least once a year for my asthma. That's what the one that speaks to me is the health benefits. But uh, in any case, we also have uh, just at the bottom $380 million for community benefits and workforce development uh, committed directly. Um, uh, and uh, that, one, that one's a, uh, I'm excited about. So uh, I mentioned that we have organized labor uh, directly involved. Um, we're also working with BC and the CSU system to develop workforce development programs at every level. So we're working on uh, uh, training programs for uh, uh, labor. This is things like, uh, excuse me, um, mechanics and uh, uh, pipe fitters and electricians for the trades level. Uh, we're also working with CSU uh, and UC on uh, higher level uh, training programs, vocational and above to make sure that we have the workforce for California to do all of the jobs that we're going to need. Uh, and we have uh, uh, community benefits. Uh, we're going to work directly with the communities for, at each of these sites to make sure that they are getting what they need out of these uh, programs, both in terms of mitigation from the impacts that the projects have, and then also direct benefits that they need, as well as monitoring so that we make sure that they're not being impacted negatively from the projects. So that's, that's my presentation for you today. Uh, but there was one more piece. I need to talk about the cost. I mentioned $2 per kilogram. Yes. I knew there was going to be a question, so let me address that. $2 per kilogram at the production sites. Uh, our target uh, overall, we did uh, significant analysis and modeling what that means, uh, delivered cost. And our delivered cost target is $5 per kilogram at the pump. Um, at the towards the end of the project, there will be, I think, not subsidies. <laughs> the right word is incentives. Okay. Incentives to make sure that we can hit by the end of the project five dollars per kilogram delivered cost. And uh, the the goal is to make sure that this is cheaper than diesel and other fuels uh, uh, delivered cost at the end. Um, and we're committed to that. And we're working with the state uh, and the DOE to make sure that we can make this uh, cost effective for the end users. Um, and that's one of the things that DOE uh, really wants because that's what it's that's what's necessary to make sure that this is actually effective. And the and GOBIS, the office of, uh, of the governor that we're working with, is the zero emission vehicle need for the state. That's their goal. That's the DOE's goal. That's our goal. Uh, we we have to make sure that this actually works for everybody. Otherwise, you know, uh, we have failed. So we're committed to that as a target. Thank you so much, Mr. Brandt, Mr. Levine. Yes, please. Yeah, two, two things I wanted to mention. Number one, uh, you are part of the tier one. Uh, Scott mentioned these several tiers. The, arch, the, the Thousand Bus Initiative is tier one. Secondly, because he's the CEO who had nothing to do with Santa Cruz being part of this effort, uh, it was your general manager who called me and said, we've heard about this. Can we be involved in this? And it led to that. But Scott had nothing to do with <laughs> it. It's actually a pleasant surprise. Uh, when you find out. So we're, we're here to answer questions. Thanks both for the very informative um, presentation and for the work that you do. It's really great to be in partnership with you. Um, I have some questions myself, but first I'll turn it over to my colleagues, um, Director Koenig and then Director Rotkit. Thank you. Very intriguing presentation. Um, so I gave a, a transit town hall the other day and talked about all these great hydrogen buses that we were ordering. The first question that came up from the public was, well, didn't they, wasn't the Hindenburg, uh, you know, hydrogen runs system, like, didn't we end runs because of hydrogen? So, like, I figured the technology's got to come a ways and be safer, but can you, like, describe how and why? The First of all, we, we thought the Hindenburg story, which was in the 30s, is forgotten, but it was <laughs> resurfacing. And by, and by the way, hydrogen goes up. It, 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 it accelerates without being under pressure at 40 miles an hour. Uh, so when that fire happened, it was ignited by the Germans used a metallic-based uh, paint to cover the dirigible, and static electricity ignited 
It wasn't ignited by hydrogen and all the scenes of uh, the, the, you know, fire uh, uh, dropping below from the material that was on fire was not hydrogen. Hydrogen was going up. But, but the more important question is the safety of, of hydrogen. And look, it's a fuel. It's explosive just like CNG that you have on site and other uh, uh, you know, vehicle uh, fuel technologies. Uh, but we have virtually had no issues. I mean, AC Transit has millions of miles uh, carrying many millions of passengers, uh, but worldwide, I showed that slide of hydrogen uh, deployments uh, worldwide. And hydrogen as a, as a, as a uh, resources used in industrial applications and the like. But at the end of the day, things do happen, right? I mean, we can look at CNG fires, diesel fires, battery electric fires. The bottom line is uh, it's a lot safer than the devil that we know and the devil that we're, we're accustomed to that you we're driving around uh, presently. So uh, we don't see it a, a real issue. We do have to plan for it. And I will say this, and I was at AC Transit when we, uh, when I built the program, and we did have a fire up there at the station in Emeryville. And that station did exactly as it was designed to do. There was really no impact on any of the equipment or any of the, the, the workers or, or individuals. Uh, three months after that fire, virtually no damage to the station. There was a, a fire at a gasoline station up in Martinez where everything got torched and destroyed. There's no carbon in hydrogen, so the heat doesn't uh, dissipate outwards that can create other problems. So, yeah, I mean, yes, but we're not proposing any blinks. Right. So, I mean, and, and the Titanic was a boat. Fair. Yes. I mean, so we're not <laughs> fair enough. I mean, so is it is it fair to say that like it's at least you know it's no more flammable than uh, natural gas? Or least, yeah, and it has different way. properties. Uh, it has a wider uh, 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 what they call a wider range where it can ignite, but it needs oxygen to make that possible, and it expands in an open air environment. It's actually a lot safer. Uh, CNG still is much heavier and it can stay low and you can yeah. yeah and so you can have problems with ignition uh liquid hydrogen doesn't require there's no toxic uh aspects to hydrogen so it doesn't pool and it can't create a uh environmental problem like the other fuels can uh, great uh, a couple other questions uh, you mentioned a target of two dollars uh Produce hydrogen per, per kilogram and five dollars um, uh, by the end of the project. Can you remind me what the end of the project? We're shooting for well, we're shooting for twenty thirty um, uh, to get everything uh, operational, and then we'll run it with the DOE funds for a couple of years. So somewhere in that time frame, twenty thirty. And we also know that as you expand your fleet, uh, you 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 need help with this. I mean, your biggest challenge is not the capital side necessarily because you get a lot of FTA money. It's the operational costs, and Michael doesn't want a whole fleet of buses that cost them three, four times more in fuel costs. So we're looking with the governor's office on how to reduce that price in the initial stages as the volumes grow and the price to market uh, a demand drops uh, over time. So, um, you talked a little bit about production of hydrogen uh, and the opportunities for biohydrogen. We certainly have enough, uh, you know, extra fuel or fuel management that we're doing around here for the forest. How, can you explain a little bit more how that work process works? I'm not an expert enough in the in the process, but we have we have companies that are actively doing it, and we'll be doing more. Yeah, but that, so that's exactly the point. They say they have plenty of feedstock. Yeah, right. Sorry, you can them. use the eucalyptus. That would be great. Exactly. <laughs> you can help me with that. Um, okay, the last question, also related to production. Um, one of the most exciting and encouraging articles I read recently was in Nature about the fact that uh, the planet actually produces hydrogen. We didn't kind of really been aware of. Uh, I think when water seeps down and hits, you know, a hot part of the core and that gets olivine and turns into serpentine. Is there any exploration for like sources of natural hydrogen in California or is that, that 
factored at all into your plan? I haven't heard about that. That's kind of like fusion. Uh, it's out there, but it's not practical right now. And and honestly, the, the most practical, affordable source of hydrogen is reforming natural gas or biogas. That's not, now, there's still a significant reduction in well-to-wheel greenhouse gas emissions, upwards of 40 to 50%, but it's not ultimately where we have to be. I mean, we can't, we can't transfer what we per currently are using that is causing damage to the planet with something that is still not going to solve the planet's problems. So, but, but the fuel cell is agnostic to where the fuel comes from. So as we can get to greener solutions, which is what Arches is focused on, uh, it doesn't require a technology uh, adjustment with, with your vehicles. You can take advantage of that advantage of that uh, cleaner, greener source as, as time goes on. There are, actually, it's worth mentioning too, there are lots of research projects looking at uh, lots of promising technologies. We're focused on things that we think are highly likely to work in the time frame of the DOE project, and they specifically said they don't want to fund research. They want to fund things that are, they're all about low risk. They want to make this happen. They want to make sure it works. There, there is a lot of promising research out there. And in fact, uh, uh, Jamie mentioned uh, the, the um, efficiency of the fuel cells. He's talking about fuel cells that exist right now. There is uh, laboratory research on fuel cells that are getting much higher efficiency than the 65% or so that he mentioned. I think that the, there's research on fuel cells that are getting in the 80s right yeah. now, um, but you can't buy those yet. But by the, time, by the time the project is done, I wouldn't be surprised if we're seeing efficiencies of AIDS. And, and, and the ARCHES program, which was very impressive to the Department of Energy, has carefully evaluated with suppliers and the process of being able to really deliver on this green sourcing, and much of it from solar and wind, using available water resources. You know, here in California, we're drought state, but for instance, that plug power project is using wastewater uh, from Fresno. And we do have, there is a lot of water that doesn't get utilized properly. Uh, so, so all that's being factored into a project, a program, much bigger than a project, a program that will deliver uh, the ultimate goals that we're all seeking. All right, thanks. I appreciate the message that we are leaders, but not alone by any means. No, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll go to Director Rotkin and then back to you, Director. Uh, you need to hand the question. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Oh, that's, okay. Director McPherson. I, I'm just uh, sort of impressed. Uh, I think that you're, you're giving a, a realistic timeline. Some of these things have been thrown out there and energy independence and inclusive procedure that you're going through is very, very impressive. Uh, that's what I, I think we it sounds like this could be a done on your timeline that you put out there, which is questionable otherwise. But uh, there's one couple of phrases there, are two terms you use is uh, objective and unbiased. And if you can do that in this political atmosphere that we have in the <laughs> today, <laughs> my hat's off to you. So. I, I have to comment on this. Uh, I think it was mentioned by Wanda, who I've been working on fuel cell technology for 24 years now. I have gone through four cycles of, oh, within five years, it's going to be commercial. But, the, and, and that was the expectation early on. But the reality is we are at a tipping point now. When we can see like AC Transit, which has now 30 fuel cell buses and they're getting 80 to 85% uptime, which is what the target is in transit. Uh, and they're working reliably and the drivers love them. I mean, the public loves zero emission, but the, the drivers like them and the technicians like them. Uh, then we're there. We're getting there. There's still improvements to be made. Uh, we still have challenges on the hydrogen side, but it is evolving very quickly. And we're at that tipping point. And as I said, these other transit agencies are really taking this on. And you, you are indeed leaders in this effort. But not alone. It is, it is one of the reasons that the university is involved, because we don't really have a dog in this fight. We win if the state wins, and if the people of California win. 
otherwise, I mean, we certainly want to get the university to carbon neutrality, um, but it's for the same reason that the that you all want to get there and that the people of California want to get there. We don't, we don't need in any other way. Um, we certainly don't have any profit motive. Um, it was interesting that the uh, DOE asked us a strange question. They, had, they asked us lots of questions about viability. But one of the questions they asked us was, how can a nonprofit do this? How can a nonprofit be effective? We don't really understand. <laughs> and we said, how can a for-profit do it? That was kind of our response. We, you know, we said, we have no incentive other than to be effective and make this work. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't understand how a for-profit can be trusted to do it. Two comments or questions. Uh, the first, we've all been aware of uh, the potential for reduced maintenance costs as we move toward whether it's fuel cell or battery. But we really haven't seen anything in those figures. I wonder, Jamie, have you come across anything of that? It's a good question. The NREL's tracked carefully. AC Transit now, and they put out a, a report with Stanford University that's every six months, thereabouts, and they are tracking labor costs. Uh, it's still not where we want it to be. Uh, electric vehicles, electric components have long life uh, to them. They're a lot simpler than an internal combustion engine. And you add a fuel cell, and a hydrogen storage, there's more. The hydrogen storage is pretty straightforward. The long life, not a lot of maintenance on that. The fuel cells are proving to also be very durable and the like. Uh, but the expectation is that will be less costly on a maintenance uh, standpoint. But with any new technology, once you, you're, you're training your staff, there's a lot of labor that goes into training and understanding. And we just had a meeting uh, yesterday with what's happening, the, the, the new buses that you will get if you move forward are utilizing another generation of fuel cell from Ballard called the FC Move, and it's a lot less spaghetti in there. If you have a five cent part, but it takes, you know, to replace, but it takes three hours to get everything detached and get in there, that doesn't work for your maintenance operation. So that's all being addressed. So we are getting there. The curves are going in the right direction. Right. The second thing I wanted to mention was I was happy to see the biogas, biogenic uh, kinds of sources for hydrogen. An old colleague of ours, Wendell Brazi, used to bring up the concept of biogas uh, collection from feedlots in the Central Valley as a way of capturing what is otherwise a methane source for global warming. Uh, let's grab that gas. And it appears from the charts, the images you show that that could be part of a uh, combination of carbon sequestration with breaking the hydrogen out, even if it's a natural gas source of methane. And that's where you get the negative CI yeah. that uh, yeah. Scott referenced, right? Although I will tell you, there are some groups out there that want and there may be some good health reasons for this to reduce our dairy intake and, 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 and the consumption of meat. And that probably is something we put in the long term. But you can't expect everyone to change overnight. So solar and wind are really still very important key production uh, components to hydrogen and green waste. Okay. Yes. 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 Thanks. Yeah, we don't, we don't currently have any feedlot based production in our in our uh, uh, network uh, specifically because of community opposition they, they hate them yeah, just really quickly in support of this notion that it's difficult to repair even if the parts cheap that you're trying to get in there so it makes a difference check out what's happening on Tesla where they didn't design these cars to be fixed they just assumed they were going to like you know last not be a problem and, a simple little thing like fixing a headlight or mm. cracking the windshield, four thousand dollars to replace the windshield. Wow. And, and you know, because it has 16 cameras in there and other things else, it's not designed to be taken apart. Offline, I could tell you a number of other stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I don't have a Tesla. <laughs> um, other questions or comments by directors. Okay, well, thank you both so much. You know, we've been, we've been celebrating um, the, the grant awards that we've been getting and the hydrogen buses that are coming our way. And to see 
that we are this fractal of this larger constellation, an important fractal. It just it puts it really into perspective and the context has been really helpful. So thank you again for being here and the work that you do and for the partnership. Well, and let me thank you for a really great staff. We, uh, you know, CTE, several of my colleagues are working with Michael and, and Wanda Moo and, and Margo and uh, you have some really good people here. and. We're looking forward because CTE is going to be under contract with Arches to support this effort as it plays out. And we're involved in some other things as well. But we really like working with Santa Cruz. It's, it's great. We're happy. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging the staff and the drivers that you said are the yeah. key points. I have a Class B license. I've driven all this, but <laughs> I can respect that fully. Uh, absolutely. Thanks so much for the chance to talk with you. Thank you, Dan. Bye-bye. Hey, wonderful. All right. Oh, wait, public comment. I almost forgot. Um, okay, is there anyone here that would like to make a comment? Okay, then we'll go to public comment online. Brian, if you can hear me, I'm... Oh, there she is. Okay. Thank you. There. Okay, Beverly. Oh, am I ready to speak? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is Beverly Show. I'm the president of the Electric Vehicle Association of the Central Coast. And um, I have been working with and educating people. We introduced the Central Coast region to electric vehicles. Um, first, I want to say that uh, we are a network of 100 chapters across the country, many of whom are engineers and um, tech people. Central Coast, Silicon Valley, San Diego, Los Angeles, Sacramento, San Francisco, Marin, Sonoma, all of the engineers in those places and across the country say absolutely no to hydrogen. It is a ridiculous waste of energy. What it takes, oh, and also Mark Jacobson, civil and environmental engineer of um, Stanford says absolutely no, it's a complete waste of energy. Anything that's said about the improvements from um, solar, wind, jobs, neighborhood clean, all of that can be done with the electric vehicles that are already here. Everything that the hydrogen industry talks about is always in the future. There is no green hydrogen that is scalable, none. It is from 95% natural gas. Natural gas has an 80 to 100 times heating capacity of CO2. Here's how it goes in making hydrogen. Hydrogen has, there has to be some fuel source which uh, turns the hydrogen into, uh, breaks down, cracks the H2O and converts it to hydrogen. Then it goes, uh, it also has to make the fuel cell. It has to compress it or freeze it to ship it. It is going across our roads and is highly explosive. Then it turns, it, it's turned, the energy is turned back into electric to run the battery that it ultimately runs on. It can go directly right now, electric school, electric buses can run directly on electricity. Our 3CE has a goal of 60% renewable by 2025, 100% renewable by 2030, and the, the vehicles will be running on wind and solar. They will be directly um, running on the electricity. They don't need to go through this whole other step that is cost prohibitive and always in the future. It's never here. It's always going to be 50 years of saying it's almost here and it's not. It's not here. Please, I, I urge you to please not go for these hydrogen buses. They are wasting our time. We are in a climate emergency. We don't Thank have the you. time. Thank you, Mr. Thank Show. You. Your time is up. Thank you for your comments. 
Any other? Uh, yes, uh, we have Brandon Freeman on the line. Great. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Good morning. Yes, we can. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not there in person today. I'm a little sidetracked, but uh, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I have a lot of support for hydrogen, and that wasn't my initial position when we started getting into electric buses. But uh, what really started changing my mind with this was uh, our ability to respond in disaster situations. I was um, the first Metro employee on the scene to the CZU fires, and we, I used a hybrid, uh, a hybrid electric bus to start the evacuations there. And in that situation, we're having to travel from Boulder Creek to the Watsonville Fairgrounds and back. Um, those miles will add up really, really quick. And when we're in the evacuation zone and we lost access to the yard, I don't know how we would have been able to get that done if we had a fully battery electric fleet because we would have had nowhere to charge it. Um, even if we could figure out the logistics of how we would physically charge an entire fleet of our buses with our very limited footprint that we have available to us, um, it wouldn't be practical in any way, shape or form to have any kind of secondary system that would allow us to charge those buses and keep them on the road for something as necessary as evacuations. Um, I can't really speak to, I'm not educated enough to speak to the different types of efficiencies and logistics and things like that with the fuel cell or what the history is on its delays. But what I do know is in, in a working stance and on the ground, if it hits the fan, we need something that we can reliably refuel and get back on, on the road as quickly as possible. And that does not seem to be a battery electric bus to me. It does take quite a long time for it to charge and you need a specific charger. And some of these battery electric buses can be very, very finicky on how it is that they charge. I mean, even now we have certain chargers that are 100% functional for certain types of buses and non-functionals for other types of buses. Um, having that kind of instability in the electric charging system is not something that we can afford to have with hydrogen that wouldn't be the same type of issue so just want to let you guys know that i do fully support our purchase of these hydrogen electric vehicles i've driven them i've traveled to illinois to drive new flyers i guess uh i guess new flyer would probably prefer to call it a prototype model of their articulated bus it does everything that i would expect it to do it handles well the public will like it the drivers will like it and most importantly we can rely on them in the same capacity that we rely on our fleet today Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Freeman, and thank you for the work that you do during times of emergency. Anyone else online? Okay, I think with that, we will move to um, our next item, which is CEO oral report. Got a little bit of a tough act to follow after that. I know, uh, I think I'll be brief. <laughs> You know, I, I do have like uh, maybe seven or eight bullet points, though. Uh, things are going well. Now, obviously, August was uh, a month where I think we're just all covering each other while folks are out on vacation. <clears throat> but since you've last met as a board uh, in your board meeting, we were awarded that low note grant from the federal government for $20.4 million uh, for hydrogen buses and uh we had the uh, uh, celebratory event announcing that down in Watsonville. It was kind of a, again, it was kind of a quick, quickly arranged event, and it really circled around um, Congressman Panetta and uh, Congresswoman uh, Lofgren and their schedules. They both wanted to be there, so we, we had a, a real quick event, but I, I think everybody had a good time. Um, just last week, the California Transportation Commission uh, fully allocated the $38 million that you were awarded in the TERSIP grant cycle. So you've got the green light now to purchase the buses that were associated with the TERSIP grant, the hydrogen station, which, by the way, uh, got environmental clearance by the county this week. And then uh, your workforce development and also your upgrades to your maintenance facility to maintain the hydrogen buses. So that's good news. It's a green light. We've got a task force team that's just uh, working on that, you know, every day, making sure that we meet the timelines, especially with the fueling station to make sure we're ready to go with that and the workforce development and so on when those buses uh, come in. 
I, I think that's all just a precursor, and certainly today's presentation on hydrogen is to review where they're at, where we're at in the in the industry with hydrogen and arches that you've been hearing about. Uh, precursor for next month. Next month on your agenda will be a contract to new flyer for 57 hydrogen buses. And of course, as mentioned, that'll be the largest single purchase of a hydrogen bus uh, of hydrogen buses uh, in, in the nation. So it's kind of a it's an event that's capturing a lot of attention back in D.C. and it's capturing attention in Sacramento. So we're trying to arrange to have some visits there to help celebrate with the board on that purchase. I do want to highlight one thing. I mean, Wandamu is our, you know, I've mentioned before, he's Houdini. I like to call him Houdini <laughs> with uh, getting money. And normally you get a, you, you go after like a 20% match or a 50% match, right? When you're going for a, a grant. And that's pretty much the case with vehicles. So Wandamu has put together a portfolio of uh, funding for those 57 buses. And I just wanted to highlight out of the $89 million that you'll be approved for those hydrogen buses uh, next month, 1.1% came from local sources. Wow. Everything else was federal, state. And so, you know, you got a great team. And, and Wanda Mu was uh, probably being in, in putting that together. I think everybody would love to have Wanda Mu on that team. Um, I do want to mention uh, that uh, we're still working with a partnership on the Central Coast Community Energy, and uh, we'll have in October, hopefully, uh, an agreement uh, that we'll bring to the board where they will uh, purchase a, a battery electric bus, and we still want to keep a mix in our fleet. And so we've been able to put together a, a partnership there at, with a the charger and so on, and they're excited to get into that uh those partnerships. They're looking forward to perhaps doing something with San Luis Obispo, doing something with Monterey Salinas Transit, but we're, they were really wanting to get it, their foot in the door. And so Wanda Mu has spent a lot of time with them to get an arrangement that will work for them and work for us. Um, I just have just a couple more things. The new website. Uh, so we're constructing a brand new website and uh, it, it's, it's gorgeous, it's functional. Uh, long story short, we're hoping to introduce it in the springtime. So we had kind of rumored that we were working on a new website that's in your budget and just wanted to let you know we continue to work on that. Um, we have just completed a triennial audit, which in the public transit world is the big audit. It's where they look at three years of anything they want to look at uh, and they dig deep and they have a full team that comes in and just literally says, here's what we want to see. And then they take a deep dive on it. And uh, we received the results of the uh, audit this past week. Uh, Chuck has led the team, uh, our internal team in that audit. And I told Chuck this is a big, big deal because uh, when prospective employees are looking at a, to, to join an agency, it's the first thing they'll do is go look at your triennial because it shows what the team's like, how together they are with, uh, with getting things done. And when the FTA is looking at things, and especially when they're looking at partnerships with us, they go to the triennial, they see if we have our app together. So uh, these audit results came back and they only found two things in the triennial audit that were extremely minor and one of them will probably just fall off to where we just have one finding. Um, I've been in the transit business for 30 years now, and I've had a couple of audits with only one finding, but you hardly ever see those in the nation, especially in the Bay Area. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that'll be on your agenda in September. You'll look at that triennial audit and the results, but your team just knocked it out of the park. And it just shows that on a day in, day out, uh, you know, day in and day out, they're, they're doing things the right way. And uh, I'd be... Uh, Certainly, uh, obviously, remiss if I didn't mention that next month will also be an important month for you. This is going to be a, a big board meeting because we'll have Jarrett Walker and Associates back with the planning effort. And again, we're looking for transformational change with Metro to keep the bus system to allow it to be more uh, fast, frequent, direct, convenient. I mean, we're just we're trying to do something significant in a way that will uh, ignite uh, your ridership. Uh, be exciting for the community, something where you can say, well, this community does have a world-class system. And so we'll be bringing to you both short and long-term changes that we envision with the bus system next month. And for that, we have a special board meeting right after this one, just to be able to tee up 
a public hearing on that day so that the public can comment on what we bring to you. Um, and then last but not least, man, you got like, we all have a minute, right? <laughs> so I got to tell you something. It was, uh, it was my turn to answer the phones at Metro <laughs> for customer service after five o'clock. And so over the last couple of weeks, I've answered all the, you know, if you called Metro to talk about the, the fixed route, where's my bus, whatever, you got me. And uh, generally, I, I let them leave a voice message and then I call them right back. And, that, and then it gives me a chance to get the information together and we can have a conversation. So this one lady left me a voice message and uh, halfway. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, you've hired over 40 drivers uh, in the past year. And that's that's amazing in and of itself. But our mantra, Marco's mantra is, I'm hiring for personality. We train on everything else, but personality is the most important piece of this whole equation. And uh, so I, I got this voice message from this lady. I'll play it. It's like a minute long, but it's, it's worth kind of ending my time. I just wanted to give some acknowledgement to a driver, uh, a bus driver that I was uh, uh, had the pleasure of being on his bus. His number was 687. I think he was driving 68 bus. Anyways, he was so respectful, calm, um, had excellent driving skills, handled an unforeseen problem with easy. He was knowledgeable to handle the unexpected the detour that came up with the mess. He had coolness and sensitivity to all the passengers if some were concerned about being late and all that. He stayed focused and he brought us safely and cheerfully to the metro. So I just really, really was impressed with him. And I just wanted to call and acknowledge uh, his skills as a bus driver. All right, my name is Francis Payne, and you have my number, um, but he's an asset. Thank you. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's what Marco's really striving for with Anna Marie, and you've got three great trainers. You've got a whole slew, 10 supervisors that are out there, but that's what really gets your ridership jumping when you adjust your routes, and then we keep focused on people that are helpful that when a when a detour or an emergency or whatever comes up they're calm full collide and, and make things happen so what a way to end your day yeah, yeah it was great it was great i'm glad uh, i'm not going to be answering the phones as of next week <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, if you have to answer any questions great. the morning i have thank, thank you yeah that, that was uh, that was a great um thank you for sharing that recording uh just demonstrates everything that goes into having that person make that call. Like it's the web of what everyone has done and contributed to that driver being that asset for our organization and our community. Um, I think Director Brown had a question and I'll go over here. Thank you. Has that driver been identified and acknowledged? This is Miguel Maldonado and today's <laughs> his day off and you no. uh, <laughs> But uh, I'll bring him next work. Okay. Thank you. Can I just say I agreed this to work for a transit district where the general manager answers the phone <laughs> for the public and the <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, think, Really, you think about the organizations that you've been part of that are large scale. And then the general manager, you know, they man even the best, you know, they manage the agency, they do the job they're supposed to do, but they do a job like answering the phone for the public, because not every call that comes in is like that one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So I just really want to appreciate Mike and the job that he does for us. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other questions, comments on the CEO or report? Okay. I don't think we take public comment on this, do we? No. Okay. And so um, with that, our next regular meeting is Friday, September 22nd. And as you just heard, it's a big meeting. So um, hopefully everyone can make it to that. Uh, don't leave because we are going to adjourn and then we are going to go into a special meeting. All right. So that's what we're doing now. We're adjourning. And um, I will open our, our special meeting section, call this meeting to order. Um,
and we just have, we'll do our roll call. We have one item on this agenda, so. Uh, Director Brown? Here. Director Downey? Here. Director Commentary Johnson? Present. Director Koenig? Here. Director Lynn? Here. Director McPherson? Here. Director Pegler? Here. Director Rocket? Here. And ex officio Director North? Here. And we have quorum. Okay. Thank you. All right. So our one item is to um, consider a resolution calling a public hearing on Friday, September 20, 22nd during our 9 a.m. regular, regular Metro board meeting, um, which will be held at the Santa Cruz City Council Chambers on 809 Center Street in Santa Cruz regarding the reimagined Metro service proposal. And uh, Mr. John Ergo, do you want to step up and say a couple words about that? Thank you. I'd like to take it too, if you, if you prefer. Up to you. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, this is super simple, but Metro has a public hearing policy that requires when the board is contemplating certain actions, primarily changes, substantive changes to services and fairs, that you have a public hearing, a formal public hearing. You all are obviously getting a lot of public comments already on this proposal. However, you do need to hold a public hearing. And so all you're doing today is calling that public hearing. You're not you know, committing to any action. And then you'll have a public comment period um, from the, the time that you uh, call this public hearing today all the way through the public hearing when you have the public hearing in September. Okay. Any questions by board members or comments? I guess I have one. I'm assuming that we will have a presentation the public will be able to comment on of an actual service plan by, by that date. So we've seen alternatives A and B and heard discussion in the uh, SPARC meetings of some hybrid possibly arriving. So there's work to be done over the next four weeks leading to that. And I would offer as a director, if there's any need for staff to have assistance, participation from uh, from a director, I'd be happy to volunteer to, to join you in that those four weeks and, and on leading up to that. And I would join you as well, Director Hagley. Yeah, I, 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 what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. The SPARC meeting brought up a lot of interesting um, additional steps and additional actions that Larry and I felt that needed attention. So... Okay. Yeah, and I think it would be important that we all help try to get that word out and market, you know, just get the information, invite people to participate so that it's not just those few that we're already hearing from, but we get a wider uh, uh, contribution or input from the community. So. We can all probably share in our own ways and help get that word out, but hopefully Metro is doing something more to get to publicize that. That'd be good. Can you ask the public if they want to comment on our plans to make this year? Is that required? Yeah. Do we take public comment on this? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Take public comment on yeah. calling the hearing. I'm calling, I'm calling the hearing, not the yeah, I will do that momentarily, but it sounds like, um, Michael, that there are a couple of us here that are offering to maybe form an ad hoc yes. committee of directors to plan and prep for this public hearing. And I heard Director Downing, Director Plager, and myself, the end uh, director. I'm sorry? I'm not pushing on to be on the committee, but if there's the help, I'm happy to see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I think with that, um, we'll see if there's anyone in the public that wants to speak about the public hearing, holding the public hearing. And anyone Grace here? Grace. Okay. Okay, great. I'll move the resolution that's in front of us to set this moment. Second. Right. All in favor? Say aye. aye. Okay. Any abstentions or nays? Okay. That's unanimous. And with that, we will adjourn. So we'll see you in a month. Thank you.